Hello, and welcome to today's session on sustaining nuclear security and security culture through decommissioning. I'm Carl Dewey, a project coordinator for the UK's Nuclear Security Culture Programme, and I'm pleased to announce that today we're joined by Mr George Foster. George was the first in-place director of security at Jean Ray Site Restoration Limited in Catness, Scotland. For those of you less familiar with the UK's nuclear programme, Jean Ray was first started in the 1950s and was a major site in the UK's nuclear programme. Today, it is a major decommissioning project, so Joe has, George has ample experience with decommissioning and security topics there. George, over to you. Thank you, Carl, for that introduction. My aim today is to promote an understanding and a discussion of the determining factors affecting the sustainment of nuclear security and nuclear security culture throughout the decommissioning phase of the nuclear life cycle. I'm not here to promote decommissioning as a step change in security delivery. I don't think it is, but I do think there's a difference in the way that security could be, should be reviewed and should be conducted as one goes through the decommissioning uh, element of the life cycle. What follows represents a personal view from experience in this area and an interpretation of IAEA guidance, more of which will follow when we look at international references. I'm going to speak for 30 to 40 minutes, allowing time for questions and comment. There is a chat function which, where I would ask you to enter your questions and comment, and Carl will coordinate these and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, for interest and to note, we've had 74 registered attendees. I don't think we've quite achieved that number at the moment. We're somewhere in the region of 50 plus, and they're representing 28 countries from across the world, including from Europe, the UK, the US, South America, uh, Southeast Asia and the Far East. Let's have a look at today's agenda. The emphasis here is not on the specifics of a physical protective system or a protective security informa information management system or a cyber security strategy or a security culture improvement program. The emphasis of the, the agenda and indeed the content is on the context and framework of nuclear decommissioning and how that will shape the approach to sustaining security through that decommissioning. I have some experience of this myself, but I've also consulted here in the UK. I've consulted with the UK Office of Nuclear Regulation, with Dunray Site Restoration Limited, with Magnox Limited and Sellafield Limited, all of which operate in the decommissioning sector here in the UK. And they've been, some of those personnel have been good enough to give me some of their time to share their thoughts and I'm grateful to them. Let's move on and have a look at some of the international references. The most notable aspect of international references, particularly the IAA references, is the absence of international references relating specifically to delivering security through decommissioning. This might be interpreted to indicate a perception of no significant change. And whilst I can see where that comes from, I do have a slightly different opinion and I seek to address this in the coming minutes. IAA references, however, do provide a rich source of understanding which allows interpretation of those factors that influence the continuing delivery of security applications and security culture appropriate to the decommissioning environment. Let's have a look at some more context and look at the terminology associated with this and decommissioning strategy. All the comments on this slide have been taken from IAEA safety standards series of publications addressing the decommissioning of facilities. They allow an interpretation of the security requirement directly related to the decommissioning mission. That is to quote, those actions that permit the removal of regulatory controls. Regulatory controls are necessary to assure the state and the public of their protection from the consequential impact of a compromise of nuclear safety, security or environmental hazards. And it's this issue of consequential impact that provides the continuing baseline for security delivery through decommissioning. In short, security through decommissioning must continue to manage and mitigate the, th the threat of theft and sabotage of nuclear material, other radioactive material, or associated systems, structures, and components, and sensitive nuclear information. The planning, conduct and termination of decommissioning presents a simple construct, but it understates the emphasis necessary to place on planning. This should be considered to be an early long term activity necessary to de-risk the administrative and technical challenges associated with it. This plan planning activity is as relevant to security as any other decommissioning activity. 
And so decommissioning will be executed through either immediate dismantling conducted at sites benefiting from unbroken planning for decommissioning, or as an alternative strategy, deferred where hazard conditions may be more complex or where, sta or where state policy on dealing with spent fuel and radioactive waste has been unclear over time. And we'll come back to this aspect of uh, decommissioning strategy when we look at a UK case study. All of that fits within the nuclear life cycle, which is presented here. And you'll see on the slide that IAEA guidance recommends planning for decommissioning during siting and design throughout the pre-decommissioning phases of the life cycle, all the way up to the transition phase before decommissioning. But I want to emphasize this is a relatively modern requirement. Ultimately, this is aimed at ensuring decommissioning is as timely and efficient as foresight can offer. This guidance is a product of, of the experience of decommissioning legacy sites, which perhaps were established during the race for nuclear, when attention to safety standards and future decommissioning held significantly less emphasis. These legacy sites tend to have poor knowledge management and archival structures, meaning there is poor histor historical safety procedures making character characterization difficult, time consuming, and significantly extending the de decommissioning timeline. All of these have an impact on the enduring provision of security. Take a comparison perhaps on a site which has been decommissioned relatively quickly. These two images show the Jose Cabrera nuclear power plant in Guadalajara, Eastern Madrid, which was in operation between 1968 and 2006. And it was successfully decommissioned between 2010 and 2020. Now I present this and the, the slide on the graph there of the detail of which is not important, but to, but to understand there is a significant element of uh, activity that goes on through the decommissioning and there is change and transition associated throughout that decommission. And I present it to emphasize the importance of early proactive planning to align decommissioning security requirements with the phasing of decommissioning. This requires integrated planning processes, insight and foresight across the business. And without this, the ongoing delivery of appropriate and proportionate security may be reactive and efficient and more time consuming. It is of note perhaps that the activities required of decommissioning a nuclear power plant and the phases associated with this, there being a clear implication of this phasing as a lengthy period of significant change. The question I pose is, does this require a different mindset and a different range of security skills, at least in the transitional planning processes of characterization and planning? Or is it just a different emphasis? Let's go back into the look at the definition of decommissioning and develop that in terms of security. And here I expand upon the decommissioning definition to emphasize the key element of decommissioning security. That of maintaining proper arrangements commensurate with the security risk relate, related to the remaining nuclear and other radioactive material. This suggests more of the same, but there's an issue of transition at play here. There's a lot of planning substance behind the expectation that security will normally be reduced during decommissioning. And it's an absolutely correct assumption, but sometimes we forget how important it is to do that prior planning. And this points to the need to really understand and generate awareness of what the transitioning from operations to decommissioning means and what this means for security delivery as, every, as well as every other uh, type of operational decommissioning uh, um, facilities. Here I expand upon the decommissioning definition to emphasize the key element of decommissioning security. That is maintaining proper arrangements commensurate with the security risk related to remaining nuclear and other radioactive material. This suggests more of the same, but there's an issue of transition at play here. There's a lot of planning substance that goes into the expectation that security will normally be reduced during decommissioning. This points to the need to really understand and generate awareness of what the transition from operations to decommissioning means and what this means for security delivery. 
taken simply, there's a simple assertion here. Change is what distinguishes the decommissioning phase from the operational phase of the nuclear life cycle. It is the single most influential factor in the transition phase towards decommissioning. And understanding this and its implications is the key to sustaining nuclear security delivery and culture through decommissioning. In time, decommissioning will become a new business as usual. But I caution against any assumption that this will be without pre-planning shaped by the insight and foresight I mentioned earlier. What might this new business as usual look like? The most significant aspect is change, and that's tempo relative to the operational environment. The most significant aspect of this change is its tempo. That is the speed at which one moves from one activity to another. And that tempo is relative to the operational environment where that speed and the, that change would have been slower perhaps uh, and more deliberate. The most significant aspect of this change is its tempo relative to the operational environment. And tempo describes the speed at which one changes from one activity to another. And I would suggest that in the decommissioning phase, that tempo is, is, is greater and more frequent and change occurs more, more frequently as well. A tempo may be driven by government policy and pressures and commercial drivers. It may increase pressure for program acceleration, compressing timescales and contributing to an increased tempo. There may be greater regula regulatory scrutiny, at least initially, to achieve the required level of assurance related to a revised characterization of nuclear material and other radioactive material and associated vulnerability assessments. Complexity may increase as a factor of tempo and concurrent decommissioning activities, or in complex environments perhaps, where category one nuclear material and category four waste is co-located, for example. This can introduce turbulence, uncertainty and ambiguity across project planning and delivery and the security integration across these areas. That uncertainty will play across the workforce unless it's carefully managed. This introduces a potential vulnerability, for example, across the development of malicious insider activity, unless it can be addressed, planned for and mitigated early. All of these issues presented may reflect or influence a change of the risk appetite as assumed or planned risk thresholds change. And this is especially possible in complex sites where decommissioning is conducted alongside operational activity. This leads to an understanding of some of the change factors involving security through decommissioning. This isn't comprehensive and not all will, will apply throughout decommissioning, but this listing represents a compilation of issues which need to be considered in order to sustain appropriate and proportionate security throughout decommissioning. And I'll pick out just a few. Anticipation. This is most effectively achieved when security is embedded in business planning structures and procedures, including the integration of engineering design and safety requirements, defining structures and processes. Does the licensee have appropriately qualified and experienced security design engineers available, for example, to address the diversity of changing security requirements across a decommissioning environment with new build facilities? I've mentioned regulatory scrutiny, at least until new assurance levels are achieved. But as an example from my own personal experience, how many licensees have considered, for, for example, the capability of a site or a protected area, access control measures to deal with the volume and increased frequency of freight vehicles involved in demolition, reconstitution and remediation? How many sites think about this clearly beforehand in terms of foresight and plan for it and plan for its integration in decommissioning design? All of these factors and the context provide uh, security challenges. Some of these challenges are about less about doing new things, but more about viewing them through a different prism. There is a burning platform in decommissioning, and that is it's planning for and managing decline of a site. Security practitioners need to think what this means for security planning and application. As a minimum, Addressing security and decommissioning should involve reviewing and challenging the assumptions in the security baseline. 
This will involve review and peer review and independent challenge to determine whether the security plan as a whole and, is, and in its constituent parts remains appropriate to regulatory expectation and proportionate to the threat. It will be necessary to review the characterization of nuclear material and other radioactive material, including its transshipment of either, to determine new vulnerabilities and revise arrangements or risk management parameters to address these new vulnerabilities. It will be necessary to look into the supply chain. This is likely to change as the program and commercial frameworks change. This will impact on the scale of security assurance necessary in the supply chain, involving capacity, capability and processes, both in security and in applying security across the supply chain. New build may be necessary to decommission, for example, the new build of nuclear material storage facilities. There may be new requirements for new waste characterization or new supporting facilities and new waste repositories. This will involve security planning. Stakeholder engagement and expectation management may change in order to reduce ambiguity and uncertainty across the decommissioning uh, phase as change occurs more rapidly. And this will be as relevant for the workforce and the local community as for the regulator. And it's worth emphasizing that the workforce and the local community will be concerned and interested in nuclear security. They'll also be concerned and interesting about it, interested in its assurance as well through the regulator and through internal assurance structures. The regulator should be considered to be a critical friend with whom we engage in early and transparent discussion and collaboration, seeking their guidance. All of this will have security impact. It should be necessary to review, validate and revise a security plan to drive modified arrangements across all security disciplines appropriate to the changes occur occurring in the decommissioning phase. There may be an emphasis on physical protective systems driven by vital area identification validation, but review and modification should be considered as an integrated assessment ta at task across all attack surfaces, therefore physical security, cyber security, personnel security and transportation security. And whilst the most tangible evidence of a review of security during decommissioning may be a planned drawdown of the physical security footprint across the security concept of operations, planning and execution should be conducted across an integrated structure which recognises the dependencies and links between the core security disciplines. This may lead to a review or require a review of the security as uh, uh, suitably qualified and equipped personnel resourcing and the planning and decision making structures that support integrated decommissioning planning. To achieve all this, there are some security enablers perhaps which we should consider. These enablers through decommissioning create a pathway to ease early proactive planning. But these must demonstrate value to the business to gain security sorry, to gain senior leadership commitment and advocacy. The senior commitment, leadership and advocacy will deliver benefits across an integrated security function, but critically in shaping a sustained, robust security culture. These enabling aspects taken together point towards establishing security alignment with the decommissioning aim and objectives and integrating security within business structures, processes and procedures for example, within the internal design authority or tier two internal assurance functions. Critical to this is that the understanding, advocacy and commitment of executive leadership and senior management, as I said, because they will direct and shape the tone and ongoing security, tone of ongoing security through decommissioning. And without this critical human factors wrapper of sustaining a strong nuclear security culture, that security culture will suffer in the face of change, ambiguity, uncertainty, and self-managed decline. Bringing all of this together, sustaining nuclear security through decommissioning may simply illustrated, be illustrated by assuming a risk management framework, the complexity of which may look like this. But what I'd prefer you to focus on is just the center radial. And that is to establish a new business as usual, by cycling through the core functions of risk analysis, risk control, 
and risk assurance more frequently than previously would be the case in an operational phase of the nuclear life cycle. But in which each major element of these is influenced by a different set of factors, whilst the enablers remain broadly similar. What makes all of this tick smoothly and which underpins successful delivery is sustaining a strong and robust security culture to the end. Now, I have no intention to dwell on security culture, but to reinforce the point made a moment ago. When one looks at Edgar Schein's three-level construct for organizational culture, which has been adapted by the IAEA, which addresses characteristics, attitudes, and behaviors across individuals in the organization, many aspects of which I've included today and sit within this, culture addresses the way in which we think and do. What the IAA model has added to this is an emphasis on leadership and management systems. And on the right of the screen, I have presented this differently to make clear and emphasize the role of leadership in directing vision and strategy to its management, in turn to implement their vision and strategy through the adherence to valued corporate behaviors through the applications of the licensees, processes, procedures, and programs. I'm now going to bring some of this, or hopefully a lot of this together in a case study looking at Dune Ray. The Dune Ray site is on the north coast of Scotland. It's sited in a remote area, seven miles from the nearest center of population. And it's the site of three civil test reactors highlighted by green arrows now being decommissioned. There's also a fuel cycle area, this area here, which is, which is the historic site of nuclear material manufacturing, reprocessing, recycling, and storage. There are high levels of contained contamination across the reactor buildings. That is all three reactor buildings here, here, and here. And in the fuel cycle area, and in the shaft area, and the silo area. This is a legacy site built rapidly in the early 1950s in the race for nuclear power. It has a site perimeter of approximately 4.2 kilometers, surrounding approximately 140 acres, and is guarded by the armed officers of the Civil Nuclear Constabulary, with a working population of approximately 800, which flexes beyond that when uh, uh, there is a heavy weight of contractors on site. It's the biggest single employer in the county of Caithness where it is located. And an article in the November 2012 edition of the Professional en Engineer magazine described the site as follows. As a nuclear facility on Scotland's north coast, at which engineers are about to embark on an astonishingly complex decommissioning project, that is the unfortunate legacy of ill-advised decisions made many years ago. This is the timeline for the site. This timeline shows a rapid expansion of the research effort in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Funding cuts into the UK Fast Reactor Research Programme led to closure of operations in 1994. The site effectively moved into deferred decommissioning from 1994 to 2012, whilst the UK government determined the most appropriate strategy for the site is decommissioning, fuel removal, fuel removal waste storage, and treatment. This length of time directly related the sensitivity was directly related to the sensitivities over fuel and waste treatment strategies and, and a poor knowledge of waste and contamination on the site, originating from poor record keeping during the build and operations in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. This point illustrates precisely why planning for decommissioning is now advised throughout the nuclear life cycle by the IAEA. The decommissioning of the site is expected to reach an interim end state close to 2036, although some observers think there is uncertainty on this date and it will take longer, after which it will move into care and maintenance and surveillance until a projected unrestricted civil use in the year 2333. Decommissioning on the site commenced under a commercial contract in 2012, and in the same year following a critical security assessment, in the international context of the Nuclear Security Summit of 2012, 
Dunray was directed to make significant improvements to its security systems. And what was the impact of all that? Well, since 2012, it's become a very dynamic workplace. Decommissioning priorities can and do and have changed at this site. This happens rarely in an operating power plant or a research establishment and emphasizes the point I made earlier about change being the most significant factor and the temper of that change that one needs to consider in delivering security through the decommissioning phase. The first impact here at Dunray was a significantly increased emphasis on security. Three security improvement programs over a period of approximately four years addressed many aspects of the physical protection system and cyber security. It addressed, addressed improvements to the site access control. It addressed an all area physical protective system, including barriers, intruder detection systems, uh, and the response force scale of effort, equipment and infrastructure. And it included a rebuild of the entire fencing perimeter. It reflected an improved understanding of material states and status, the complexity of decommissioning, and the scrutiny which had been placed upon it, and the senior strategic level of interest and engagement on this program of national importance. Executive leadership and ownership was reflected in the recruitment of a site security director and the establishment of a separate security department. Direct security representation was established for the first time in the executive committee and on the executive board. This gave, this gave security a voice in the business and credibility amongst colleagues, improving focus and collective awareness and commitment. A civilian guard force was introduced to conduct routine access control and security control room tasks, enabling more effective and cost efficient use of the highly trained armed response force. New facilities were built. Low-level uh, low waste vaults were built, as you see here, it shows them in various stages of the build, to eventually entomb low-level waste. A waste encapsulation plant was built here before, to encapsulate waste before its transfer to the low-level waste vaults. New facilities with stringent automated access control measures were established in the, in the fuel cycle area to enable the characterization and movement of material. Another new complex facility was built in the fuel cycle area to enable the loading of nuclear material onto purpose-built vehicle transport for its movement off-site. The movement off-site of highly enriched uranium and plutonium entailed years of planning and execution across different regions and nations by multiple transport methods and the build of new facilities to enable this. All elements of this required a planning emphasis on all aspects of security including the installation of a secure information systems capability and even accommodation for armed escort police to main maintain operational security of the nuclear movement, nuclear material movements. A new weapons firing range was built in this location to enable the armed response force to train locally, thereby reducing time and expense lost in absence training at distant locations. The increase and change in the supply chain working in the site drove a significant uplift in the need for security vetting clearances, the absence of which would have had a consequential impact on decommissioning operations. Vulnerability assessments became routine business, as was the management of temporary security measures and a higher level of regulatory scrutiny. These and other factors drove an increase in security staff of 80% in two years. And now planning to understand and preempt the changes in security requirements is formally embedded in business risk management processes with the aim of coordinating all the factors and impacts of, of the decommissioning program while staying adaptable to change as change continues. Now I'll close by emphasizing my earlier point. All of this to me illustrates the importance of having the foresight to see a significant increase in the tempo of change to acknowledge and preempt it with early detailed and integrating planning. And that's the most significant aspect to understand in terms of security delivery through decommissioning. That is change occurs and that tempo of change increases and security needs to be adaptable enough to manage that. We'll now go to um, questions and answers and I'll hand back to Carl. Thank you. <laughs>